Hello and welcome. I'm Anne Mossop from the UNSW Centre for Ideas and I'm very happy, happy to welcome you to this in event in our new international conversation series where writers and thinkers from around the world join leading UNSW researchers to talk about inspiration, ideas and discovery. We're coming to you from the UNSW Sydney campus and I would like to acknowledge the Bidjigal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us here tonight. Our conversation today is with Murray Hildebrandt and Richard Buckland about new technologies and the law and it's presented in collaboration with the Australian Society for Computers and Law. It's a pleasure to introduce our host Richard Buckland, an expert on cybersecurity in the Faculty of Engineering here at UNSW Sydney. He's a frequent commentator on cybersecurity risks and the threat that cybercrime poses to our trust in systems and institutions. He's also an award-winning educator and somebody who's renowned for creating powerful learning communities. Before I hand over to Richard, I want to remind you to, the, to join the conversation that they're having as well. A little bit further down in the hour, there will be time to take questions from the audience and you'll be able to go to Slido, that's sli.do, and enter the code UNSW to add your own question or upvote someone else's. Thank you, Anne. I'm so pleased to be welcoming Murray Hildebrandt here tonight. Murray is um, an expert on the topic of new technologies and the law. She is unusual because she has a, feet, uh, a foot in, in, in each camp. She's uh, an expert in computing and an expert in law and legal practice. She is very interested in the rule of law, and we'll be talking about that tonight, and some of the challenges of the interface between computing and the computing community and law and the law community. Some of the challenges she's likened to the difficulty of nailing a pudding to the wall. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the Australian Society for, Computing, com, uh, for Computers and the Law for organizing tonight's event and for inviting me to host. Um, and I'm looking forward to a fabulous conversation and talk from Murray. Uh, now, <coughs> to introduce Murray. Murray is a research professor of interfacing law and technology at the Free University of Brussels. Her research explores computational law, including machine learning and blockchain technology. We're here tonight particularly to talk about her recently published book, Law for Computer Scientists and Other Folk. <laughs> Murray says that the book is a result of eight years teaching law to master's students of computer science whose agile and inquiring minds made each course an intellectual feast, which is a lovely thing for a teacher to say. As a computer scientist, I have so many questions for Murray. Welcome, Murray. Um, Richard, thank you very much, and good morning from Brussels. <laughs> it's, um, it's fabulous to, to have a fireside talk over breakfast. Um, and um, uh, I imagine you can now see my first slide. So uh, I'm going to kick right off, and I'm going to treat you uh, to some explanations of why I think that law and computer science, which most people think are really very different things, which is a fact, but nevertheless, I think for many different reasons, they are also a match made in heaven. So why does it matter that lawyers get their act together and begin to understand some of the things that computers computing systems can and cannot do, how that works, and um, what is the methodological integrity of computer science and of law, which is, of course, different. <clears throat> Just to set the scene, um, I imagine I do not have to remind you of um, uh, uh, things like robo-debt, of not robo death, of course, but robo debt, um, and the famous example of Compass in the United States. 
And I want to take as an example, and I may come back to it, um, an algorithm in Sweden that decided about paying out uh, unemployment benefits to people, where it became known that the algorithm had made a mistake in 70,000 cases, but they could not say which cases. So we're talking about millions of decisions over the course of, I think, five years. 70,000 were wrong, but they didn't know which ones were wrong. Now, to grasp that, I think it is very important to understand something of computer science. Um, so maybe it's good to mention that I uh, was awarded an ERC Advance grant for a project called Counting as a Human Being in the Era of Computational Law. So much of my research <clears throat> is now focused on the integration of artificial intelligence uh, but also things like rules as code into the law. And for that, I'm collaborating with a computer science team at my affiliation in the Netherlands, the science faculty, computer science department, and the law faculty, my main affiliation here in Brussels. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is take uh, a viewpoint that I wrote for a forthcoming issue of ACM magazine, so that's the, the, the glossy of the computer scientists uh, at a global level. Um, I believe it's a fabulous magazine. Even people like me, lawyers, can, can read it. Uh, and I wrote, I was invited to write a few points, and I wrote a few points on, under the title of Understanding Law and the Rule of Law, a plea to augment uh, CS curricula. Of course, augmentation now has this, um, this ring of having high tech <clears throat> involved, but I'm going to talk about another kind of augmentation. So the first question is, why does it matter for computer scientists and other folk, non-lawyers, to understand law and the rule of law? Well, actually, that's very simple. Because we believe, as a people in constitutional democracies, that everyone is under the rule of law. And that means also developers, uh, providers, for instance, global tech platforms are under the rule of law. And this is, uh, in a sense, directly connected to a historical development, 17th century Europe, we, where we said we don't want to depend on the ethical inclinations of enlightened despots. So it's very nice that they're enlightened, that they have good intentions with us, that they don't want to do evil, for instance. But we want to decide for ourselves who is ruling us. And it was Montesquieu in uh, quite a, some time ago uh, who invented this idea of sovereignty dividing itself and installing checks and balances or facing the fact that there will always be power, um, there is no society without power, and that the, the trick is, the important thing is to organize countervailing powers. So rule of law and democracy can be summarized, they can be compressed, as a computer scientist would say, perhaps, into this one statement, governments should treat their citizens with equal respect and concern. That's a wonderful statement because it both says something about democracy one person, one vote. But it also says something about what happens in a democracy when the majority begins to rule, namely that they should still respect each and every person in the minority, which means that democracy is not the uh, tyranny of a majority. Now, this is an important maxim <clears throat> that sort of reigns in constitutional democracies. And uh, just as a side remark, do you think we could formalize this to, to bring this um, under, uh, to look at this from a computer science perspective, we would have to formalize this maxim. Um, and if you want to formalize something, so if you want to move from natural language and from real life events or concepts, you have to find a proxy for it. 
So that means you would have to find a proxy for uh, concepts like equal, like respect and like concern. Um, the interesting question whether that would be possible at all. Uh, I think it would. You could probably find prox different types of proxies. And then the question would be which proxies in which uh, circumstances is the right one. Um, and then you're back into an adversarial debate. So now, again, this question, why law matters for computer scientists and other folk. Let's have a look on one hand on rule, law and rule of law, and on the other hand to computer scientists. So law and rule of law is an architecture. We have legislations, we have case law, we have public administration making <clears throat> all kinds of decisions, but we also have people buying things concluding contract with each other, suing each other because of uh, somebody causing damage. So law is an architecture, that means it's multidimensional, and all these different aspects are interacting with each other. So we have complexity, uh, but it's a specific type of complexity because the law works with natural language, and that means it works with ambiguity. That concepts that the law uses have an open texture, and that means they can be contested. The meaning can be contested. Now, my experience with computer scientists is that they have a keen eye for complexity because they know what it means to build an architecture based on rules, on code, <clears throat> and even data-driven systems, even machine learning, of course, is built on code. And on what happens if uh, complex systems begin to interact, which means uh, can you still predict the behavior of a computing system if you let it interact in an environment with other computing systems and with uh, systems of the real world. So my experience with computer scientists is that they have a very dedicated acuity as to the limits of formalization. <clears throat> so you cannot do computer science you cannot build computing systems if you do not formalize and make everything machine readable. And there are, of course, limits to that. <clears throat> and I have the feeling that at this moment, computer scientists understand those limits um, from the inside and much better than many people who have a kind of pseudo-religious faith in whatever computing systems do. So computer science is about a design and the behavior of computing systems. <clears throat> and let's hope that's also about the verification of these systems. That means you build a model of the system and test it mathematically. And the falsification of testable theory that contributes to scientific research. So that means you don't just um, run your program but you ask questions like what is actually being said here. You could talk about validation, so empirical testing. What happens if you put that system in the real world? Maybe mathematically it's all fine, but when it starts to interact in the real world, um, the real unpredictabilities come in. Now, legal research is about the interpretation and the development of positive law. That is the law that is valid in a certain um, uh, jurisdiction in a certain country. Um, and um, <clears throat> th that means that legal research is research in, into this architecture, this multidimensional system of binding legal norms that define a specific jurisdiction. I will come back to that term because it's a very important term in the law. Um, and part of legal research and part of the practices law is to ensure that different interpretations can be argued about. Um, sometimes uh, the connection with the slide. <clears throat> so we're working with computer systems and that means sometimes me moving my computing mouse, let's let's now not touch it. It's jumping around the screen. Okay, let's leave it at this. Um, so here you see that interfacing uh, me and technology has all sorts of uh, erratic results sometimes. 
So look at um, the last boldly printed uh, remarks here on the right side. So computer science and computer systems generate what I call computational normativity, that is code-driven and data-driven. Normativity is important a concept because I, I'm not talking about morality, but about the fact that these systems generate certain behavior, make certain behavior impossible. And um, that means that they create certain habits in people and they restrain people in a certain way. And of course, the law does the same thing. Uh, it does the same thing based on democratic decision making. So we agree on what should be prohibited, how we should be constrained. Now, whereas computational normativity is code in, or data driven, legal normativity has been text <clears throat> driven for a long time. And uh, lawyers don't talk about their, um, their study, their science and their practice being text driven because it is so obvious that we don't see it. It's like the water that a fish swims in, but it's crucial. Our field, our domain is currently text driven and it has all sorts of implications. Also, when you bring into that field um, computational systems that have a different type <clears throat> of normativity. Why? Well, computing systems depend on disambiguation. And so if you if you need to write code, if you have to develop these systems, you have to disambiguate. You mean this means that you have to be clear to the system um, which meaning you want to formalize. Um, this is also connected with the idea that computers are based on discretization. So that means uh, you're working with one or zero, and that trickles through the whole system up to more abstract levels in the computing systems. Uh, and it means that you're always starting out with mutually exclusive variables. And sorry if that's all humbug to uh, some of you. Uh, maybe it's not that important. Maybe the most important thing is um, that we're working with ones and zeros and that natural language is intuitively a very different sort of thing. Um, Computing systems, when they make decisions, they achieve, let's say, closure. So at some point they have to make their decision. That's also why we need to disambiguate, otherwise the system will halt. Um, and it's always based on a series of assumptions. And those assumptions are often mathematical assumptions and you have to make them, otherwise you can't get on with life when building these systems. Law is a very different animal. It's all about natural uh, language and it's all about um, uh, ambiguity. So this ambiguity, you could say, opens a space for contestation, for different types of interpretation of the same word, the same sentence, paragraph or larger text body. Um, and that the interesting thing about the law using natural language is does it, that it does just that. So. It opens this space for contestation, which is core to the rule of law. But the function of the law, of course, is to then provide closure so that we all can get on with our lives. That's called legal certainty. So let, let's, let's say that the kind of effects and consequences that computing systems have in the real world are sort of either defined by the code or they're emergent because the code is interacting um, in itself or with the rest of the world. In law, we're talking about speech acts that have a very specific type of effect. Think of a civil register that is concluding a marriage and that tells you I declare you husband and husband or husband and wife or wife and wife, and then registered that in the register. And from that moment onwards, um, a whole series of legal effects are in function. So there is a very peculiar, now I can't move forward. Yes, I can. Okay, so uh, I'm moving on to um, 
the concept of jurisdiction, which is an extremely important and crucial concept in law and in constitutional democracies. Why? Because legal norms are always limited to a specific um, a group of people, country, state, um, <clears throat> and that means to uh, the people who live in that state, and we call that a demos, a people. And law is always restricted to that. Um, and that means that the sort of questions that law has to ask, and I'm going to take the example of fairness, like what is fair, which is at this moment an important subdomain in uh, computer science, uh, trying to, um, to invest in developing fair computing systems <clears throat> that make fair decisions. Now, the first thing a computer scientist then will say is, okay, let's define fairness. And let's please define it in such a way that it can be um, formalized. The problem is that you can define fairness uh, as a computer scientist uh, demonstrated a couple of years ago in at least 21 different ways. And of course, many more. Um, <clears throat> and I mean computational decisions computational definitions. <clears throat> and that means that when you uh, implement that definition of fairness into the system, that it will start taking decisions that are fair in that particular sense. So lawyers are very used to juggling with different fairness conceptions and different um, perspectives on fairness, like fair compared to what? If you're thinking about an algorithm that decides on benefits, for unemployed people, then you can say fair compared to what? So should we compare the fairness here to fairness in, for instance, um, uh, contract law or fairness in uh, punishment? Think of the COMPASS uh, algorithm. Fair compared to whom? Are we talking about the fairness to the people who are denied wrongfully uh, a benefit? Or are we talking to about fairness, unfairness, to the people who are paying taxes and who are thereby paying for uh, unfairly attributed um, uh, unemployment benefits. And the last question, fair in respect of what? Are we talking about private interests? So the interests of one particular person who does or does not wrongly or rightly get the benefit? Or are we talking about a public interest that everybody has a decent income, public interest about redistribution of income uh, at the national level. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that a lawyer is used to have all these different considerations around fairness in their head, not always deliberately. Lots of this is tacit knowledge, but it's a very different thing uh, from what a computer scientist might want to do also because they might be more interested in developing a universal, a general um, understanding of uh, fairness. And of course, um, maybe the difference comes down to fairness requiring judgment, which means in the end there is a normative decision after balancing a lot of considerations and not calculation. Calculation basically means that you make that normative decision at the beginning, that is already in the system, so that is basically hidden. Um, so we can be very short about this. Some of the things that are crucial to the law are the fact that you cannot disobey, that if you cannot disobey a law, it's not law. So you could develop a system that makes all these decisions, assumedly always the right decisions, and self-execute, so there is no way you can get around it. Um, I think in a constitutional democracy, we believe that that would be a bug, a system that always gets its rights and that you cannot disobey. So the fact that you can disobey a law is not a bug, but a feature. So law is not a discipline, it's not brute force or mechanical apl application. It's more about consolidating reasonable expectations. And the concept of reasonable here is, of course, a very difficult and very ambiguous concept. And it's precisely the concept that gives you that flexibility that you need when judging. 
very quickly about the way law um, binds, the binding force of law, of code, and of ethics. <clears throat> because as we know, many people are talking about ethical design. Um, so code binds because it defines at the level of the code specific behaviors or um, it defines the code in such a way that specific emergent behaviors that are not entirely uh, predictable emerge. And to the extent that those uh, behaviors of the code have a real impact, like make decisions about whether you can a benefit, um, there, there is a binding force, so there is a kind of normativity. Ethics binds by way of moral duties, uh, utilitarian considerations, or by helping people to develop a virtuous character. That's a very different way of um, binding. Yeah, let's get this out of the way. Okay. Um, now, how does law bind? First of all, in constitutional democracies, we start with a democratic participation. So there is a legislature that makes the decisions. Second, the law has performative effect because it cannot force you to do something. Um, it sort of appeals to all of us. The minute we agree with each other that you can just go and murder somebody, whether the law prohibits it or not, think of a failed state. This is a real thing. That minutes the law, the, the performative effects of the law, like whether something has legal effect or not, disappears. So you could say that the law is a real, is the reality of the social contract. If that disappears, the law disappears. And again, I think that's a feature, not a bug. And of course, the law is connected to the monopoly of violence. And monop uh, contestability is key here. Okay, this is, um, <clears throat> I think this is actually the last slide. Um, and I, I just want to point out that in the project that I uh, discussed in the beginning on computational law, we've now also started a uh, new journal. Uh, it's not a journal within the project, of course, it's a journal outside the project with a, uh, a fantastic uh, co-editors in chief, Frank Pasquale and Virginia Dignam, where we really have um, tried to bring together um, excellence papers in uh, computer science and in law, every paper is replied by somebody from the other discipline, um, which means we hope to get a real conversation going. Um, thank you very much for uh, bearing with me, and, and I'm extremely interested in the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marai. That's fantastic. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, on behalf of everyone here, um, thank you very much. I loved your book, and it's even better to hear you describing some of your ideas in person. The title of your book, For Computer Scientists and Other Folk, uh, uh, it is a, a, a brilliant title. What, how did you stumble across that? Just, just quickly. Ah, very quickly. Well, I gave a course. I gave two courses, and one of the courses had as a title very simple law for computer scientists. But I realized that the book should go to more people. And then um, I wanted to get the dryness out. <clears throat> and I, I like this idea of folk. You know, we're all folk. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and get the lawyers can be a bit hierarchical. And, um, you know, so I, I thought, let's do folk. Yeah. Is so, it short enough? <laughs> it's, so it's great. And really, I think it sort of captures what excites me most about talking to you, which is, it seems to me there are different cultures. So there is a legal culture and a legal way of thinking and legal students are surrounded by legal academics and probably have legal friends and work amongst lawyers. And to them, a whole lot of things probably become normalized and things that seem obvious are, are, just, are obvious just perhaps because of their surrounding and their everyday life and, and what gives them success. And, and similarly, computer scientists, um, the, the films we watch, the friends we have, the books we do, every, every, we are in a, a different culture. It's a bit CP Snow-like almost. Yeah. Um, and the other folk 
to me sort of acknowledges that possibly there's even a, a, a third group, which are people who are neither lawyers nor computer scientists. And I, I have this theory that we're not very good at understanding each other. And I have another theory that the computer scientists are often in a position of power when it comes to creating technological solutions and pushing them out. And lawyers are probably in a position of power in government. Many of our politicians, are, and, and they speak the language of power. So it seems to me th this conversation idea of yours is very important. It's important that we understand each other. And I'd like just to start by chatting about that. Um, how, you, you, you've alluded to it briefly here now, but how do you see the differences between the way computing people think and their worldview, and the way that lawyers think in their worldview, and, and possible harms in this difference existing? Uh, well, computer scientists have this, um, uh, this, this very special sense of humor, I think. Uh, there, there is a cartoon theory which is very famous. I'm now the name um, escapes me. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, when I, to give an example, when I put out the vacancy for the lawyers in our team, um, uh, one of the skills, or it's not even skills, the, the, the people I want should have an affinity with mathematics. And um, I realized when I put that in a vacancy, the amount of lawyers uh, in which the, the uh, pond in which I'm fishing suddenly becomes very small because I yeah. don't know many lawyers who say they love mathematics. So I'm not looking for mathematicians. So we have computer scientists who, who are basically mathematicians. Uh, that, that's the other team. So I'm not looking for lawyers who are basically computer scientists. I am not a computer scientist. I'm looking for um, uh, people that indeed have a different mindset. I think so. Um, and um, maybe to answer your question, I can explain that in this project, we are not going to develop a shared language. If you apply for funding in Europe, uh, then one of the things to say if you do an interdisciplinary project is to say, we are going to develop a shared vocabulary. And that sounds very impressive. And for me, that means that both sides are going to commit treason. Take the example of a term like optimization. In computer science and mathematics, that has a very specific meaning. If you begin to talk about that outside that very specific meaning, everything becomes confused. Yeah. In law, a concept like um, uh, employer, for instance, has a very specific meaning. It depends on which law, which domain you're talking about. Are you talking about criminal law? Are you talking about uh, administrative law, private law? Uh, it has a very specific meaning. If you then begin to open up that term um, uh, and, and tell a computer scientist how to uh, define an employee, and uh, the computer scientist may then look it up in a dictionary and, and read a bit more about it and then say, OK, now I know what an employer is. I'm going to define it. I'm going to formalize it. And then the lawyers will think, well, you, you just can't do that. You have to first wonder which jurisdiction, then which domain of law, then which act. Then you have to look at the case law and then you can start. So there is a very different sensitivity about what matters. Uh, I remember uh, giving a talk to uh, computer scientists, and I think we were talking about privacy, and uh, they literally said to me, look, why don't you folk solve the problem of what you mean with privacy? Tell us, we'll formalize it and solve it. <laughs> and I said, okay, now we have to go back to square one, because that's not how it works. And what we want to do is to to have this respect. Yeah. So us lawyers, we must respect computer scientists for their methodological integrity, for what they are committed to doing, and vice versa, of course. And, and that means that every month we have a session with the computer scientists. We pick one concept. We did like um, ground truth, deep learning, hypothesis space, uh, loss function. 
We read into it, we develop a series of dedicated questions about it to get it right on the technical side, on the uh, side of the math, uh, etc. They answer the questions and then we develop a uh, definition of a couple of pages, uh, so a short one and some explanation, some more narrative. Um, and we, they develop that until we say, okay, lawyers can now understand it. And yes. this is what I think is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I hear you saying the treason is, is very strong language. There's a bit of oil and water. But I'm, I'm wondering, is this a characterization? Computers, in computer science, we love formalization. And we tend to think what's happening in the platonic world is what's actually happening. That, that is the real world. And that's both our strength, perhaps, and our weakness. I think I hear you saying that, uh, the, and we have great respect then for law and definition and, and think it must be literally followed. And it's, the sense I got from your work is this notion of contestability, that, um, you know, that, that laws aren't laws unless they can be broken and that's a good thing and perhaps sometimes we should break them. That, that lawyers are um, much more attuned to this notion of contestability of definitions not being hard and fast, of things being fluid, of forgiveness, of, 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 of flexibility and change. Uh, and I, I wonder if, I, I am always thinking my students are disempowered when they graduate if they are only computer scientists because the, the power language to me seems to be lawyer and politics and influence and, and, and I would love them to be more powerful, not just to be employed by people or build things for people, but for their opinions and ideas to have more impact. And I wonder if your, your project of, of bringing these two groups together, even if you can't turn one into the other, um, I, there just seems to be something very healthy about it because the, I think we both will benefit from learning the ideas of the other. Do you see this in your teaching? Oh, yes, I see it. Um, it, it I, I wish you could see us uh, convening. So we have three hour sessions and we've been doing that now for a year online. So in the beginning I thought, okay, let's bring the session back to one hour because it's so exhausting. <clears throat> After three hours of exchanging where everybody has red ears and sitting on the uh, front part of their chairs, <laughs> wanting to intervene, uh, usually then I stop after three hours at a committed time and usually they go on for another hour because they are so excited. Huh? So there is an enormous, there's not just respect, there is curiosity in the true sense of saying, tell me what you are saying now because, and you must imagine the sort of questions are like this. Okay, you just told me this. Does that actually mean that? No, that doesn't mean that at all because that. Ah, then you're saying this. No, we're not saying that because of that. Oh, that means you're saying this. Yeah, that might be true. Ah. Now I'm going to explain more. And this for three hours. And uh, so people sometimes they make this, uh, they say, uh, my mind is on fire, especially I think uh, the lawyer's mind gets, gets boggled at different instances, of course, uh, from the computer scientist. I think a core concept of what you're talking about here um, is the concept of a proxy. So if a computer scientist wants to do something with a computing system in the real world, this translation has to take place. So if you take a concept like fairness and you want to test whether your system is fair, then you must always first find proxies. And that act of translation, like you're going to say, proxies okay, in the real world, is that is this what you mean? So a proxy that basically means you want to model something that is in the real world, and that model is going to be your proxy. So yes. you're going to say, I want to talk about fairness, and your proxy is uh, equivalent outcome. Huh? And and that, for, that's so funny, right? If I can interrupt, because I was operating backwards. I was already in the theoretical world and I was wondering, oh, do you need a proxy in the real world? But you're, you're, you're in the real world and you're saying, we should build a proxy in the theoretical world. Yeah, so I'm saying that you can't do computer science if you don't first uh, yeah. develop a proxy. Yeah. And then I think what is so important is that if computer scientists, and I think many are aware of this, 
But if they, if if computer scientists learn to think about it, reflect on it, and explain it, then their influence is going to be so much bigger because then you can tell a policymaker, okay, you can. Uh, make a choice between buying these six systems. Uh, that one is cheaper, that one is faster. But I can tell you that that one works only with one kind of proxy, uh, and it's very dangerous because no, they're not going to explain you all the assumptions that actually don't fly. Yeah. And that one is cheap, well, because their proxies are so wrong, they're yeah. so limited. Yeah. Uh, everything that comes out of that system is going to be wrong. But I'm offering you a system where we're going to discuss the proxies and we're going to play around with them and say, if we use this one, equivalence uh, outcome with a lot of other um, um, qualifications, then that will be the result. If you use this proxy, then that will be the result. Now, if computer scientists can have that conversation and please, if lawyers learn to appreciate that conversation, it yeah. will be so. Yeah. We, we live in a third world. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I love this discussion um, of, of their, their, their brains on fire. It's every teacher's dream. When, when the smoke starts coming out of the ears, we know we've succeeded. And, and, and then wanting to stay longer. <laughs> That's wonderful. Three instead of four. My students are <laughs> glad to finish up to two. So I, I think th this is very truthful. When you see this happening, it's very truthful. And what, what lies behind, I think, what we're both talking about is not only the difference in these two camps. I think we need to acknowledge, and, and you do in your writings, there's great similarity. That in, in some sense, um, lawyers and computer programmers are very, very similar to each other and have much in common. And lawyers probably could have been good programmers, and computer programmers, uh, scientists probably could have been good lawyers with, with a different uh, choice long back in the past. I, I do think what we have in common is probably as great as, as how we differ. Though, though how we differ is so interesting. I, I have one possible, oh sorry, um, I had one possible suggestion as to a way we might differ and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then if we've got time I'd like to ask you about policy makers. You raised influencing them and I think that's very important. One possible difference is to people that aren't computer scientists, or, or, or aren't even programmers, say, um, I think they can have too much respect for computers. Uh, and um, whereas no computer programmer has much respect, I think, for computers. And possibly it's the same with lawyers and the law, and this is why we talk about contestability. So if, if I'm in a lecture and I say, oh, has anyone here ever written a program that had a terrible mistake in it? The room just laughs. You know, there's not even point in answering that. We laugh. We know everything we touch is broken. Every day we make mistakes. Every line of code, we, well, not every line, but every function we write is littered with errors. Everything we ship is full of errors. Everything we analyze that other people have written is full of errors. After we spent a year and a million dollars trying to remove all the errors, it's got just as many errors. You know, it, so, so, we, so anyone that places a lot of faith in software to us just seems ludicrous, but I see our politicians like with RoboDebt doing that, and that would be a very healthy appreciation, perhaps, and perhaps even for lawyers to have. What do you, this, what do you think of this? Well, I have nothing to add. It's, I, I completely agree. Yeah. I, I see lawyers at this moment like um, <clears throat> the response of law to legal technologies is either oh, this is impossible, computers can never do it, we don't have to bother about it, yeah. which is very dangerous because it's yeah. happening. Yeah. Or it is, oh, Mireille, you have no idea what these technologies can do. They are yeah. fantastic. Yes, yes. It's, it's almost like a, a primitive um, response, isn't it? It's like we've traveled back a, a thousand years and we're showing them uh, some piece of technology and either they worship it or they hate it and there's no... There's nothing in, in, but perhaps that's the true value that can come from a meeting of the cultures if we can all emulate what you, you're doing and bring them together. A, a complete loss of respect. Yeah. <laughs> that, that if everyone else could lose respect for computers and perhaps if computer scientists could lose respect for the law, perhaps, perhaps that would be a good, a good step. Yeah, well, <clears throat> but um, yeah. So we, we should res maybe lose respect for um, for for the snake oil, oil stories yes. are, uh, and we should have respect for the people who built these systems yeah. because uh, we're using them every day, like yeah. we can do now 100%. because they exist. 100%. Um, so, 
And I, I would be very much in favor of respecting the law um, if, if it's part of the law, right? Because, um, but, but, so the law is imperfect and that's why it's great. And yeah. this, I think, 100%. is sometimes difficult to explain. Yeah. yeah, difficult to explain to a computer scientists because they will, they will want to universalize, to mathematize, yeah. and to, to say, but but can't we make it better? So, um, to to do a sidestep, Karl Marx thought that the ideal society would be a society without law, right? Because everything is okay, and there, that's the most dangerous yeah. um, idealism that exists. Yeah? yeah, there's always going to be power. So you always need to look at these countervailing powers and um, because we're all um, alive and that means changing. Yeah. Uh, the minute it's perfect, it's already imperfect. And that's, that's grace. We should be grateful for that because, uh, yeah. This is the quote of the day. We could drop the mic now and go home. Could you just say that again? That the moment it's, the moment it's perfect, it's imperfect. And that, that is great. I, I think this love of imperfection, not love, but cherishing and not giving up in the face of it is what makes all successful computer science and all successful software development and presumably all successful law. We, we, very soon we'll throw this open to questions from the audience and there are so many questions flooding in for you. But I would love to just close with one last thought um, that policymakers themselves often don't have a background in computer science. Um, and yet they make decisions that affect um, technology and the use of technology in society enormously without, without having this sophisticated understanding, perhaps with this more naive on-off, you know, devil, you know, worship sort of, worship or, or hate sort of dichotomy. Um, what do you think of the notion of rather than always trusting, rather than ever trusting computers utterly, there should always somehow be a human in the loop? What do you think of this idea? Sorry, the last sentence, there should always be? Pat, should there always be a human in the loop? Or can we ever trust a computer entirely? <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> I think from a computer scientist perspective, it makes a lot of sense to talk about human in the loop because the system has to make all sorts of decisions. And uh, the more decisions it can trustfully, uh, trustworthily take itself, the better. So you, you, you might put a human in the loop, but as little as possible, because that's what automation is about. From the perspective of society, the concept of a human in the loop, I think, is a very wrong concept. So I'm forever saying what we want is the machine in the loop. Yeah, there are human beings, and we hope that society becomes better in many ways by having machines in some loops, so maybe maybe even the concept of loop is a very cybernetic concept that uh, might not fit very well <laughs> here. But we want machines in the loop and not humans. So the whole paradigm has to be turned around. If you are going to give people a decision about unemployment benefit by a machine, then that is very efficient from a very short-sighted perspective. But if you want people to get work, it is very important to have seen this person and to have given this person courage and to have the sort of acuity that a human being has, but also the human proximity, which is of course a very strange term in Corona times, but this, this care, like machines, they can simulate emotion, yeah? they can simulate I would say anything, they can simulate anything, but what is simulated is not the same yeah. as the simulation. So in the end, I think it will be much more effective uh, to have less of these automated decisions because then people will, um, if, if you give a person the feeling that they are heard, that their voice is heard and that they are respected as a person, they will do anything much better and more effective. So the, the struggle between effectiveness and efficiency, that's an economic um, thing. I, th this is something that policymakers <clears throat> have to better understand. So don't use these machines to make things efficient, but to make them more effective. And that means you have to ask yourself a lot of questions before 
and how uh, to implement them. <clears throat> that's, that's a wonderful summary. Thank you, Marais. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, we have so many questions from our uh, keen observers here. Uh, he's, I'll give you the hardest one first. How do you form, this is from JM, how do you form laws for things that don't even exist yet? Theoretically, we're pr proposing this often when ideas don't exist yet and might, there might be something entirely new when, when the laws are applied in the future. I think that's a wonderful question, and the answer is that law is always about things that don't exist yet, because the law is about um, uh, what happens in the future, and the future is not there yet, right? So what I always say about machine learning systems <clears throat> is that you cannot train an algorithm on future data. That's, that's, that's too obvious to mention, but it has enormous consequences. Because you have to assume in machine learning that the distribution of your training data and validation data is the same as the distribution of the data that uh, is, is in the future. Yeah? That's a nice assumption and it works most of the time and sometimes it doesn't. Now, the difference between law, which is articulated uh, in natural language, is that it is highly adaptive. Yeah. So it's fit for closure, but it's adaptive. If you look at the GDPR, <clears throat> then I believe that the GDPR has um, found the right level of abstraction in terms of technology specificity that we need. So the question that is asked means that lawyers and, in fact, legislatures they have to sit down and say, OK, if we become too concrete, then tomorrow this will be outdated. If we make it too abstract, then it will apply to anything. So we have to be very specific and we have to think of lots of scenarios. But let's say there is a difference between imagination and prediction. A machine learning system and a, a computer scientist that is developing a decision tree and, and putting all the possible use cases in a row and developing scenarios, that's prediction. And what a lawyer has to do, and let's not talk about a lawyer, but a legislature, is to imagine. And imagination, based on natural language, the, the concepts that you're talking about, they can be sort of stretched, and they are interacting with other concepts. And that means that the GDPR, when it talks about um, solely automated decisions that have legal effect or a significant, uh, similarly significant effect, <clears throat> and basically, this Article 22 was already in the 1995 Article 15. That is covering all of machine learning, blockchain, etc. And uh, why? Well, because the people that wrote the um, yeah. previous and the current had this foresight. They talked to many people who are into computing. Yeah. And they, you know. So this is it. We need. We need the computing voice. We need the, yeah. both cultures at the table when the legislation is drafted. I, I, I would love that. And also, is it the case that not only is technology changing, but basically what we're seeing with technology is an example of society and the environment we're in changing so rapidly. So our norms and expectations and the things we're used to and our intuition probably isn't reliable because there'll be new consequences and unexpected outcomes. So whatever the law is, and no matter how imaginatively it's drafted, and no matter how abstractly it's stated, uh, it, it probably also needs an element of fluidity, uh, ability to be revised, and an expectation that there will be a rev revision and review w whenever we are in a state where the world is changing quickly. Would that be a fair uh, requirement as well, do you think? Yes, I think that um, there is a difference between um, expectations and reasonable, legitimate expectations. And in concepts like reasonable, which is a core concept in the law, in private law, uh, in public law, in criminal law. So reasonable gives you that flexibility. So there was a time when the walls of your house offered you privacy, probably in an accidental way. The walls were there, built there maybe to keep the cold out or whatever. 
At this moment, it's, it's of course, very possible uh, when, when you sit behind your computer, behind those walls, that uh, lots of uh, very intimate information about you is going all around the world. Yes. So yeah. the, the question is not whether our expectations change, which is something that people like Mark Zuckerberg will say, yeah, well, people's expectations are changing, right? So they don't care about privacy anymore because the landscape changed. The question is whether uh, the reasonable expectations changed. And uh, Mr. Zuckerberg does not get to define that. Uh, and computer scientists don't. <laughs> In the end, that's democracy. And I think it's even more than democracy. So if everybody says, from now on, we're allowed to kill whoever we need to. So think a failed state. That, that moment can come if, if the state is no longer capable of protecting people against each other, then they will do it themselves. Now, just because of the fact that it's come to that point doesn't mean that we should live in a society with as a reasonable yeah. expectation yeah. that somebody yeah. might kill you. Yeah. So reasonable has a normative impact that is even beyond democratic um, uh, decision-making, it, it's the moral core of constitutional democracies. And privacy there has, for instance, has uh, is a public good. You cannot have democracy if people don't have privacy, because they will be manipulated, and they, they, they will not dare to speak out, and their capacity to vote and to participate um, is gone. So the law has these concepts, and they are continuously tuned um, and and that's where the flexibility uh, of the law comes from yeah. and you can't do that in a computing system you can do many other things yeah 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 there is no reasonable operator is yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now I I think I'm going to be lynched by about 700 people that have asked questions so um, if I ask the questions really quickly and if you could just answer them perhaps with a nod or a shake of your head or, or say a few words um, we could, I would love to talk forever, um, but, um, but we can't. Uh, so Jacob asked, Jacob Lancaster, what advice would you give to current and prospective law and IT students, and how can they play a part in protecting the rule of law in 60 seconds? Take a minor in the other discipline. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, we can just... We can hum a song for 40 seconds now. And <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more, but I, I'll, I'll move on. What's the appropriate governance body or regulatory framework for artificial intelligence? This is from Adrian. Is that a 60 second question? <laughs> yes, yes. OK, let's do it. Um... Uh, private law liability, strict private law liability for anybody who puts into the market or makes available um, uh, software that is not properly uh, verified and validated and that has potentially harmful impact. Uh, that, that's the first. That's about physical safety. Second, um, fundamental rights assessments. Um, that must be conducted uh, again when the uh, applications are put on the market or made available, because we are also talking about open source. Um, uh, I, I think these are my would be my main two caveats. So make sure yeah. that somebody who wants to make a profit or somebody who just wants to share their exploratory stuff, which may have terribly dangerous consequences, make sure that they are strictly liable for damage and probably have to do a lot of certification in advance. I also have ideas about requiring, in the case of machine learning, <clears throat> to pre-register your research design that has to be updated so that people can see what sort of training data you've used, what sort of hypothesis space you have developed which performance metric you're doing. Uh, I would actually, any system that makes decisions on individual persons, don't give me the accuracy, give me the precision. Yeah, I really yeah. like also the, sort of, that you didn't just pick a single answer. I think this, this question is almost too big for the page um, because the consequences of getting this wrong are so vast. 
Um, yeah. uh, so there is probably, it was a trick question, there probably is no single body. I think all your suggestions were really good, but I also think they're just the start of the conversation. And this is a really important question for us to be asking and all grappling with and thinking about. Uh, and I, I predict we will more and more over time. Um, even though computers make decisions and could make decisions for us, they're still written by people who have their own biases. How would you ensure that they're fair? That the, the, if there's a loop replacing a human judge, say, with a computer, how would you ensure fairness there, using your contested words? Yes, so I, I think that's one of the major questions. Um, uh, and I, I especially like that the loop is brought in here. So think legal tech, think you have a, a robot judge. Let's, let's do some hypotheticals. Um, that robot judge is pro probably using a system like Westlaw Edge or LexisNexis in, in its advanced, more advanced stages. It's already quite advanced, actually. Now, um, if I were a judge, a human judge, and uh, I have these fantastic technologies that tell me what is the right decision, and I keep on checking it, I keep on doing it myself and comparing, and every time the machine gets it right. Oh. Do you seriously think that I'm going to continue checking? No, I no. would say, okay. Yeah, yeah, let them it's like do it. uh, screening at airports, you know, screening for the guns. No gun, no gun, no gun, no gun, no gun, no gun. They have to stick a gun in occasionally just to keep the guards alert. <laughs> I, yeah, I could tell stories about that one. But <laughs> the, the, danger, the danger here is that it basically means that the output of these systems will become the new decisions that feed into, yeah. that they train on, right? Then you have a loop. And now these judges that are sitting back and doing other important work, as it's always said, they will have lost yeah. the skills yeah. to check. And that, that I think, is a, an enormously important challenge. So... Um, bias is uh, bias is inherent in life. When I'm, if if I want to live, I have to profile my environment continuously. So we have now built machines that are capable of such profiling, of anticipating yeah. how their environment will respond to their behavior. That that's that's very advanced. To be able to do that, they need to. Uh, detect bias and to implement bias. So the question is always, um, when is that bias functional, effective, and at what point uh, could there be uh, six different ways to be functional and effective, yeah. two out of which are outrageously uh, discriminatory, uh, three are, you know, it doesn't really matter, and one um, would be great. Yeah? And And yeah. this conversation... Which bias, as, as it, it, it's not yeah, as if these yeah. systems are biased or not. Right? Yeah. They're always yeah. biased. Yeah. Uh, so are we, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that. Thank you. That is a brilliant answer, and not where I thought you were going. Do you think and, we can answer two questions in two minutes and ten seconds? Oh, definitely. Let's try. Um, uh, how does, imp this is from Lyria, how does imperfection of code feed into projects such as rules as code? Does it limit its application, or will transparency be better than the status quo, like Robo did? I'm, with rules as code, I'm particularly worried that um, the fact that you have to write um, the legal norms in, in a, a form that a machine can understand will restrict the yeah. natural language code. Yeah. And, and that has all sorts of implications. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and... Final question, and I'm so glad we got to this one. How do you view the impact of the implementation of China's 2017 cybersecurity laws, including their data localization requirements? <laughs> uh, I have to pass on that, but I will ask you to answer that question. Ah! You are an expert here, so please ah, do. Ah, ah, ah. We have to hear now, so please, please. Um, uh, what do I, I don't think this should be about me, but I, I do think... Um, that it is a, a sobering lesson for the rest of the world. And we are lucky 
that we are seeing that. Just like Australia was very lucky that we got to watch the West of the world's response to COVID um, and, and we could avoid some things, I think we, what we can see in China is a Petri dish. We're seeing an alternative world, uh, a Kripke type world happening, and we can, we can learn from that. I, I find it um, worrying as I think everyone who's interested in rule of law uh, it would, would find it worrying. Yeah. Um, Ray, do you have a closing uh, a, a quote to even outdo your previous fantastic one? We have 12 seconds left. I'd hate to waste them. <laughs> um, yes, lawyers should learn to love um, some of the insights that computer scientists can bring uh, to the law. Thank you. And they don't have to love everything, uh, but yes. Thank you. I love the use of love. I love ears on fire, brains on fire. I love everything about this conversation. It's been a real pleasure to have you with us and to see, to remember how intellectual discussion should be, that fields shouldn't be little lonely, isolated places. We should be bouncing ideas off each other and looking over fences into other backyards to see what we can learn from there. Um, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And I'm also very jealous that you have all those nice bottles, presumably of Belgian beer behind you. Uh, I, I, uh, I am, I am just jealous. Now, we've reached the end. Shall we, I'll just call that over the top. Shall we now just wrap up and thank everyone for coming? Yes? Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Murray. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to working with you, and I hope you come out here again. This time, don't bring the gun with you. Uh, and <laughs> and, 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 and may, may you continue to mix oil and water and produce wonderful mayonnaise. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. This was a great conversation because of your questions, your acuity, and, and of course, your knowledgeability. Yeah. Well, the Thank questions you. came from everyone here, Marie, and that is the third group we should answer, the other folk. Everyone who's sending questions, who, please forgive us if we didn't get to your questions, but everyone who did, there were great questions, and there are so many more. We have enough for another session another time, but that should be another time. Thanks, Marie. See you. Thank you.